and team AMC for inviting me again. Well, I'm going to speak on TKR following a high table of start B. <coughs> uh, well, preoperative evaluation is of utmost importance in all joint replacements, specifically if it's a failed, uh, you know, fixation for osteotomy or any internal fixation, you need to rule out infection. Then more important with HTO is you need to rule out RSD. There is a lot of patients post HTO, they have RSD, so that may be a cause of pain. Response to HTO is though the patient was better after that and it has failed in, you know, eight to 10 years. And then whether the pain is coming from spine only or from uh, not from spine, I mean, it's not from the knee and it's coming from spine or hip or any place else. Uh, skin condition uh, is very important because there would be a scar of previous osteotomy. Uh, you get the standard radiographs done. Uh, you ideally require to do templating in these patients because sometimes there's an offset of the canal in tibia. Uh, the slope is also, you know, uh, sort of it's either increased or decreased in these patients. And the main issues are basically four. Uh, the, the issue with the surgical approach, you have anatomical deformities uh, because of a previous osteotomy which has been done. The ligament balance is often difficult to achieve in these patients. And the fourth is the <coughs> what implant you want to use in these patients. Uh, well, the skin incision is a midline incision. Uh, if there's a previous scar, you, you use the lateral most incision because all the blood supply comes from the medial side. So uh, you have to use the lateralmost incision. If there's a transfer incision, cross it at around 90 degrees, not, never less than 60 degrees. And if you're making another incision, not using the previous incision, there should be at least seven centimeters in between uh, the skin bridge. Then uh, other important thing is in these patients, uh, often scarring is there, so you, your flap should be very deep. Your full thickness flap should be uh, raised if required. Okay, then comes the issue of hardware removal. Well, if they are stable, sometimes you can do a knee replacement with the stable in situ, and if they do not preclude your tibial resection or not coming in the way of your keel, uh, sometimes you require a separate lateral incision to remove any plates and do a, you know, do it in two stages, remove the implant first and maybe do a total knee later on. Uh, suppose the patient has a valgus deformity post HTO, then you can use a, you know, you can use the lateral incision to remove the plate or the implant which has been used, and then you know, do a lateral parapetalar approach. Uh, sometimes uh, you might have to do a TT or a tibial tubercle osteotomy also. Uh, very rarely you might have to do a, you know, use the lateral incision, come medially, and maybe, you know, uh, do a medial parapetalar approach. Uh, so like this, so, you know, the implant is dead lateral, so you, you, you cannot remove it from the midline incision, so you require two separate incisions. Then uh, with the approach, the biggest problem is once you are inside, uh, then the petlar tendon is often short adherent because the HTU is proximal to it, there is laxity which gets contracted, and it is very fibrous. So the tissue is very fibrous, it is very difficult to evert the petla in these patients <coughs> because of the shortened petlar tendon, because of the petla baha, the Q angle is altered in these patients, and postoperatively also these patients are predisposed to have petlar subluxation and flexion is often less as compared to a normal total knee replacement. Uh, for the difficult petlar aversion, you might use a pin, otherwise you, know, you, you might you know, <coughs> uh, uh, averse the tibial tubercle. You might have to do a lateral release. You might have to do a, you know, extensive approaches like a tibial tubercle osteotomy or maybe you, know, you might require a quadriceps snip also in these patients and you should be ready for it. Uh, the anatomical deformities post uh, HTO are, they are both in the coronal plane as well as in the rotational plane of the tibial plateau, and often there is a change in the tibial slope. So if, you're, if it's a lateral uh, closing wedge osteotomy, what happens is the, you know, the, uh, the deformity is much more marked, and if you want to do a total knee replacement, you know, you have to be sure that your key is going right. You cannot, you know, uh, you have to place your tibial component flush with the medial side, not the lateral side, because there will be offset and there would be interference uh, with, the, uh, with the shaft there. And many of the times there would be rotation also proximally. So you have to be careful if it's a valgus osteotomy which has been done or the lateral closing wedge. On the other side, the medial opening wedge osteotomy, which is done more commonly nowadays, here the deformity in the tibia is less. Uh, however, you have to be careful because, you know, often graft has been there, the osteotomy has healed or not, there's a lot of, you know, plates which have been put there, the medial side is tight, you require more extensive medial release in these patients, and then, you know, the slope is much, is, uh, the slope is increased in the medial opening wedge osteotomy, so you need to be cognizant of this fact. 
the proximal tibial cut intermediary jig usually cannot be used in this uh, and the cut has to be very conservative very less and mostly in a lateral closing wedge osteotomy you have to cu you cut very thin laterally and very th uh, there's a big uh, bigger amount of cut on the medial aspect uh, and uh, you have to be careful of the tibial slope also uh, even a failed osteotomy hto with a virus deformity, you know, you would be still cutting less on the lateral side as compared to a normal osteoarthritis knee where more lateral bone is removed. So you have to be careful and take a very conservative cut, not more than uh, 6 mm from the medial side or around 2 mm from the lateral side. Then there is rotation of the proximal tibia. So, you know, there's an increased Q angle, more commonly with the closing wedge osteotomy and all these things would make your, you know, placement of the tibia difficult. So if you're using anatomical tibia, you know, then you would have difficulty. Sometimes the medial side is, uh, lateral side is smaller. So you have to use a symmetrical tibia, try to use a symmetrical tibia. And uh, another thing which is important is uh, because the tracking and uh, everything would be difficult, it's, a, it's maybe a good idea to use a rotating platform uh, in these patients because uh, they would help, you know, take care of some amount of uh, uh, the rotational <coughs> problem with respect to the you know, uh, placement of the tibial component. Then uh, you, you might have to use a simple tib smaller tibial tray, always flush with the medial side because that is the side which is normally, you know, <laughs> intact. And you might have to use an offset stem if you are using stems. Uh, ligament balance is difficult because what happens in HTO uh, is, you know, you have uh, <coughs> pre HTO the LCL is elongated and you have not done anything for that. So. So you need, for balancing, you might have to release more of the MCL in patients who have got a recurrent, uh, you know, a recurrent virus after HTO. Uh, sometimes if there's forced valgus after HTO, this might, uh, you know, overstretch the MCL and then make it incompetent. And, you know, you basically have a valgus knee. So you have to treat it like a valgus knee. Uh, certain examples. So, and the other, exam uh, other problem is that the petla is quite inferior or petla baha is there. So, Sometimes it might impinge on the tibial tray in extension, so you might have to do a petal replacement and you have to use a smaller petal poly, place it as superior as possible, and the inferior bone you can uh, remove with some rongers, taking care not to damage the petal tendon. Well, the choice of implant in these patients is a posterior stabilized implant because the PCL is often abnormal, it is contracted, there might be insufficiency, it might, it's very difficult to balance PCL, and sometimes in these patients, uh, offset stem should always be with you. You might, uh, you know, you should have a semi constrained type of prosthesis also as a backup and petal resurfacing has been recommended because of a, there's a high incidence of anterior knee pain in these patients. Uh, as coming, coming to the results, the results are varied. You know, there are some studies which say that the post HTO TKR has results which are comparable to a primary TKR. And there are the other uh, authors we have seen, shown that the results are, you know, as uh, as you get after revision TK. This is because, you know, post HTU you can have, you know, uh, sometimes the HTU is very well done and, you know, you might have, you, you do not have a lot of deformities in the proximal tibia is as good as, a, you know, a normal total knee you are doing. Sometimes the deformities are much higher, so converting these are severely overcorrected high table osteotomy with ligamentous laxity, petal inferior, these patients, the results would not be great. So you have less satisfactory results or no difference is the latest <coughs> RCT sort of thing. Uh, sorry, systemic analysis in which they have found that the, the high risk of revision in TKR falling high table osteotomy. Then uh, nowadays, uh, the, uh, the lateral closing wedge is much less done. So the mainly what is done is the opening wedge osteotomy. Uh, we don't get so many patients post opening wedge osteotomies uh, who require a TKR, but uh, it has been found in literature that the results are similar whether you do a TKR for a closing wedge or a opening wedge osteotomy, these are the only four articles that I could find. Uh, specific with the opening wedge osteotomy, you need to be careful that you require more medial release in this. There's an implant medially, so, you know, you have to take it out. Sometimes there is a scarring there also, so you have to be careful not to, you know, <laughs> damage the MCL. The slope in, uh, is mostly increased in this uh, <coughs> opening wedge osteotomy, so you have to be cognizant of this fact. Uh, you might require to remove the implant in these patients. And uh, sometimes, uh, most of the times, you would require stems to bypass the osteotomy site. However, the biggest advantage is that uh, with the opening wedge osteotomy, the anatomy of the proximal tibia is much less disturbed, and the risk of interference between the TK implant and the industrial bone is much less as compared to a closing wedge osteotomy. Uh, <coughs> now, again, literature has seen that, you know, which are the patients in which TKR 
falling STO, what are the factors which were associated with poor outcomes? One of the biggest is the workman composition patients, specifically in the Western literature, patients who have had an undiagnosed RSD or in which the patient was less, uh, in which, you know, the, there was no pain relief post HTO within the year, patient started developing pain or patient had had previous surgical procedures prior to HTO also. So there are a lot of issues associated with the, you know, it's a complex situation. Some people say it's as good, you know, as close to uh, doing a revision to total knee replacement. So you have issues of hardware removal, extensive scarring, eversion, petta eversion, there's, you know, soft tissue balance is difficult, sometimes there's a problem with alignment also. All of this translates into increased surgical time, increased blood loss, they often have less flexion and there's an increased chance of post-operative complications, specifically skin necrosis, deep infection, petal complications, uh, sometimes per perineal palsy also and arthrofibrosis too. So to conclude, it's a technically challenging, uh, you know, operation post TKR, uh, TKR in a post HTO patient. Uh, you should uh, do meticulous planning. This is the one of the patients where you should do templating if possible. Uh, soft tissue balancing has to be careful, uh, as well as the position of the component. And you should always counsel your patients preoperatively regarding the result. They should not expect a result as if for a native osteoarthritis knee or TKR done for that. I thank you for your attention. Any question from audience to Dr. Vijay Kumar? No, thank you, sir. We thank are you. actually in time constraint. Oh, one question. Mike, please. Uh, Vijay, a uh, very nice talk. Yeah. Hi. Now, uh, you are also doing a lot of unis. So which one do you find more difficult to revise? Uh, See, from uni the, to yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, it's a proven fact, you know, revision of a uni is much simpler than revision of a HTO. But the demand is different for both. When you're re revising a uni, you require, you know, the, you require a stem on the tibial side mostly. Whereas with respect to a HTO, uh, you might not require stems most of the times. But you would face a lot of soft tissue, you know, challenges, specifically with respect to balancing with arthrofibrosis, with petal eversion, all those things they are much more difficult uh, in a post HTO. And then there's an implant which is outside your incision. With a uni, medial uni, the implant is in the incision and you can just take it out if it has, you know, failed, other than a fracture, you know, if it has just failed, you, it comes out very easily. So a revision uh, post uni, I would say, is easier to do as compared to a revision post HTO, a failed HTO. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Bajay. you. Uh, now we have a very oh. now we have very uh, interesting topic 